Welcome everyone to a very special edition of Everything Zen. I'm your host Mark Sells, and this month we're celebrating the series finale of Van Helsing on Sci-Fi. You can watch season 5 full episodes on Sci-Fi.com right now, as well as seasons 1 through 4 on Netflix. Today, we're joined by the talented Heather Dirksen, who not only stars in Van Helsing, but has been seen in shows like Smallville, Stargate, Battlestar Galactica, Fringe, and Supernatural, just to name a few, as well as voicing iconic characters like She-Hulk, Psylocke, and Princess Leia. Well, Heather, welcome to Everything Zen. Thanks for having me. I want to start by going back to the beginning, uh, Destination Manitoba, your childhood, your parents, what did they do? Um, What kinds of things were you into as a kid? And what did you want to be when you grew up? Oh, I had one of those um, little year end scrapbooks that my mom gave me. and And on one of the questions was, what do you want to be when you grow up? And it changed every single year. And it was, uh, I don't know, there was like, actor was in there often, but then there would be like, you know, um, scientist or explorer or, you know, adventurer and mother or, you know, whatever it was. It was just something that changed all the time. So I think that, you know, actor was in the back of my head percolating, but it didn't come Mm -hmm. to fruition until later. But yeah, that was kind of the Manitoba. It was just playing. We lived there till I was six. So we moved when I was six, and basically my whole memories of Manitoba is playing, just playing with the other kids. And it was really hot in the summers and really cold in the winters. (laughs) Right. What what did your parents do for a living? My father was a long-distance semi-truck driver. He would take uh, these huge, uh, you know, loads of whatever across the whole country and take a week or two and drink many, many cups of coffee and make his way back. And then um, my mom, she, she, she raised us kids, which is also a hard job. And then she went back to school and um, became a teacher uh, years later. But she, uh, she stayed home with us kids. So, nice. yeah. Keeping everybody in line. Keeping <laughs> everybody in line. Just, you know, good old-fashioned working, working dad and mom staying at home with the kiddos. That's what it was. A lot of actors get their start at an early age doing commercials. Some grow up knowing they want to be an actor and nothing else. And and some get the acting bug in high school drama, performing in front of their peers. What I read about your bug bite uh, was that you had gone to college to study science and ended up changing majors to theater. And I was wondering how that came about. What was the trigger or spark? Yeah, well... So I kind of had it in my head that I uh, wanted a steady paycheck when I grew up. And, and, I, and, and then I had that, that myth that, you know, they tell you that artists are just going to be starving their whole life and, um, you know, discouraged, not by my parents. They were, they were artists themselves. But in general, I think um, maybe art is discouraged as a career form because the starving artist type of concoction that everybody tells you. So I think that's why I really wanted to go forth and study something that would give me a regular, consistent paycheck and not something that was unpredictable, something I could count on that was important to me. So that's why I pursued that. I also enjoyed it. So I'm like, well, of the two, I'll just go for this kind of consistent thing. And then when I hit college and I was studying science, which I was enjoying. I also had to take, um, they call them breadth requirements, and it makes you a more well-rounded student when you graduate. You have to take classes outside of your uh, major. So I took an acting class, and I had acted in high school too, but this particular acting class, the teacher was, I would say he was more of a motivational speaker than anything, and he, he kind of had us find a spot in the room one day and he's like okay now close your eyes and picture what makes your heart sing and ask yourself why you're not doing that and ask yourself how you can start and for me I just pictured myself performing and I'm like okay I guess I'm I'm gonna take the jump because I don't want to 
I don't know, look back at the end of my life and be like, I had an opportunity and I just didn't go for it. If this doesn't work out, I can still go back to school and take the science, you know? So I, I, I switched, I switched from science to theater and thus became my, my journey to where we are now. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I love, I love that story. It's, it's a very difficult thing too. I mean, uh, to, to very gutsy, to be able just to switch gears like that and um, not really knowing what the, the future holds. It was about definitely um, there was fear involved. And that was the thing that was stopping me. Like when he's like, what's the thing that's stopping you? It was definitely a fear. And so I, I was like, well, what's the worst that can happen? This, this doesn't, uh, I don't know, like you're going to become a, a better person because you're working on yourself as an actor and that's what you do in school. But maybe this doesn't give you a paycheck. Oh, well, then you go back and you study something else. That's the worst that can happen. And, you know, at the time I was young and I felt like I had the time to, to do that. So I decided right. to take, take the risk and jump. And I'm, I'm just so glad I did that. Absolutely. Over, you know, feel the fear and do it anyway kind of thing. <laughs> well, and, and the older you get too, the, the more difficult it is to, to uh, you know, jump right into those types of things so easily without having that fear kind of, oh, I need to have the, I need to have a backup plan. Yeah, I think that the the stakes get a little higher the older you get for some reason. I don't know, maybe it's because uh, maybe kids or you have um, more at stake financially. Or I'm not sure what that is, but I also applaud people who take those leaps uh, later on in life too, because that it really does take a lot of bravery. I think for sure. Yeah. Now, after graduating, you formed the uh, Genesis Theater. Uh, what necessitated the formation of the theater? Was it was it kind of a natural next step? Was it because there were a lack of opportunities or was it, was it boredom? How did that come about? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was, maybe it was a little bit of, of everything. That particular program, uh, I went to Simon Fraser University in Canada here and they really taught us to create our own work, not to wait by the phone for someone to call us with a magical opportunity mm. to create those opportunities. And, and, and by doing that you would um, you would be exercising your own artist heart and putting that out into the world. So they kind of encouraged you to find your people, the people who were kind of on the same wavelength as you. And we got together. It was there was six of us all together, and we wrote and we directed, we acted in, and we produced our own theater shows that also incorporated film. So we were working in both those mediums and um, learning about both along the way. And so I, I was primarily stage when I, when I started acting. I did mostly stage. And then these films kind of filtered into our shows as well. But it was all original material, mostly comedy. And it was uh, such a blast to do that for, I think it was a couple of years we did that. And I did get my agent through through doing that. So it was like I created, not like I created it, but uh, just by doing my own work and um, finding my people, this opportunity arose for me to step into film. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Well, and, and this is really fascinating to me. Also, you have an extensive resume of voiceover work that goes all the way back to your first acting roles. Um, yeah. You voiced a character in the Barbie Diaries, as well as <laughs> several characters in English subtitled for Japanese TV series, like uh, yeah. Death Note and Nana. Death Note. Yeah. yeah. How, how did those roles come about? And when did you realize you had a talent for voicing unique characters? Oh, that was my agent, my very first agent that I got. Um, it just happened to be part of an agency that also had a branch in, in voice that did voice. Not all of them do. So most of them or some of them focus just on, on film or just on stage. But this one also had a voice department. So he was just like, listen to your voice. You've, you've got to get into voice. And I was like, oh, what? Me and my man voice? Like what? I was like in my 20s and it, was, it never was something I thought of ever. Um, but my agent pointed it out and was like, well, here, we're going to provide you with all of the materials to create a demo. And then we'll just pass it on to these 
voice studios that we work with. And if they're interested, then you can start going in for auditions. So that was kind of my in for voice. And then I mostly started off in commercials, you know, get 50% off when you buy one of these and then get one of these, you know, (laughs) it was just, it was more commercial land. And then I started getting, yeah, then I started getting dubbing series like Death Note and um, some cartoons like the, the Barbie Dyers was my very first one. I was um, kind of an, I don't know, like a nonchalant shopkeeper that Barbie comes into and I, I give her some inspirational diary to write her thoughts into and <laughs> that's that's fantastic so funny but yeah that's kind of how I started into voice and then once I started I was like holy crap I just love this so much it's um it felt very liberating because it was all about putting everything into one instrument just into your voice no one cared what you look like you you know that wasn't part of it um which I don't know, can feel a little limiting in, in film and even stage. So with voice, it's like, if you can do the voice, then you're going to get the job and, it, and very specific direction. It was just so great. It was, I became very passionate about it and I still do it. So fun. You sure do. Um, <laughs> you, you've gone on to voice some of the most popular characters in the pop culture universe. And by that, I mean, Betty Ross, a- a- a.k.a. She-Hulk, uh, yeah. Princess Leia. I mean, Emma Frost, Psylocke. What is your process for creating a unique voice? Where do you find uh, inspiration? Well, I mean, I have kids. So we do watch cartoons on a regular basis. And I watch them actively with them because I love them. I've always loved cartoons. So I, now I kind of listen... Um, I mean, I do listen to it and watch to enjoy, but I, I watch the cartoons to research too. So I'm like, oh, and then I try the voices and my kids get annoyed because they're like, don't, don't repeat the voices. Um, you're ruining <laughs> like, it. You're ruining it. But I try to, uh, you know, mimic what I hear. Um, I'm constantly playing with how young I can get, how old I can get. That changes, um, you know, as you go along in your career what you can do with your voice um, changes as you evolve and get older. So um, yeah, I mean the process, it depends what they, if, if it's a voice match, sometimes you get these voice references and they said, they say, we want you to match this exactly. And then you listen and you try to just match the tone. And as a musician uh, or coming from a musical household, I can kind of find where the, the tone is if it's going up or down if it's you know a crescendo or like whatever's happening there um but then if it's create this character from scratch then they just kind of send you a a description of the character and it's up to you to come up with it uh from your own head so sometimes I'll do one really crazy take that I send along to casting directors and then I do one like fairly um low-key take to send along that's more conversational I don't know, really know what the process is. It just comes to you as you're, as you're looking at it. You're and if a they send it up, <laughs> it's so great. I mean, Emma Frost and, and, and she Hulk. you have these images too, that you can work off of. You can see them and find a voice that matches their physique um, or what you think it would sound like. I don't know. It's so fun. It's just so fun. It's just playing all the time. <laughs> right. Well, well, let me <laughs> ask you specifically about Princess Leia. Um, were you influenced uh, by Carrie Fisher at all? Or was your approach to distance yourself from her iconic role and create Heather's version of Leia? That one was a voice match. They were looking for a Carrie Fisher voice for that one. And so they sent along some of, uh, um, some of the most, her famous lines. And um, I just tried to copy them like, Exactly. However, the script they send along isn't from the movie. So you're not getting the exact lines. You have to like transpose the sound of her voice onto these brand new words. So that one was definitely um, channeling Carrie Fisher. And this was before she passed. So it was, um, it, it means, I don't know, maybe even more now that I had that opportunity or that chance to do that. Just what a cool thing to do. It was so dreamy. I mean, it was all of the things, Star Wars and Disney and Carrie Fisher. I just, I was like, is, did I just reach the pinnacle? Is this it? Did I, <laughs> this is it. I can't even get higher. 
<laughs> I know it's I know it's like asking you to choose amongst your kids, but do you have a favorite voiceover character? Mm, that is hard. I would say that, um, and it is one of the more recent ones, I guess, too, is Skylar from Ninjago has mm. been super fun. She's kind of in my realm. She's similar to me, um, definitely, you know, elevated, but um, she's really brass and um, strong and she, she fights with the ninja in that. I don't know. It's, um, she was really cool. She's one of my favorites. And then also um, Snowblazer from Dino Trucks. Oh, yeah. She was a one-off guest star for one episode. And she was almost like Dory from Finding Nemo meets, um, meets oh, I don't even know, like some crazy superhero because she just forgot everything all the time and was just kind of like her head was in the clouds and she really wanted to make friends and she was very in your face I just loved her so much she was one of my favorites too Snowblazer Hmm. a lot of actors would be happy to land one or two of these types of roles and your body of work is incredible Um, All of these iconic series I've really enjoyed, and I know our fans know exactly what I'm talking about. Blade, Supernatural, Bionic Woman, Smallville, Stargate, Battlestar Galactica, Fringe, Sabrina, Van Helsing, Charmed. That's just a sample. What do you look for in a role? Um, Is there certain criteria that you've instructed your agent to be on the lookout for? (laughs) Yeah, well, my, at this point, my agent knows me so well. I've been with her for 15 years and she just kind of gets it. She gets what I'm um, looking for or maybe if I want to change from a certain kind of character, I'll ask her to look out for, you know, I mean, right now, because I've done so much sci-fi and mm-hmm. actually a lot of them have been like either witches or, or vampires or aliens. I've done a lot of creatures, which I love. Um because there's a lot of, I don't know, you can play so much with them. There's not as many limitations, but I do want her to kind of keep an eye out for like either comedy or um, more like a human. <laughs> Just like playing a human would be a would human be great interest for, story. Sure, a human, a human being in the next in the next show I do would be great. So yeah, I definitely um, she'll send along really juicy roles and um, I'll say either yes or no, this is landing with me right now. But I have that luxury. I think I've, I've been doing it long enough that I feel like now I can say no. And I wish that I'd had that wherewithal when I was younger to um, feel like I could say no. I think when you're younger or when you're just starting out, you feel like you have to say yes to everything. And mm-hmm. I think saying no is, um, is very important, especially for for um, female act- actors. So um, knowing that you have that option and that nobody's going to think less of you or never give you an audition again if you say no to something, you know? So, yeah. well, it's yeah. a 22, I think, you know, at an early age because you're trying to establish yourself. And so the only way that you get to where you are today is, is through experience and kind of knowing what you like, what you don't, what you want, what you don't. Yeah, that's exactly it. So it is through the experience that you find out, oh, for sure, this is a no, or like, yeah, this is, I'll give this a shot. For sure, it is um, just by doing it. That's how you learn, I guess, with anything. Yeah. With with all of these franchise sort of pop culture series, what's been your favorite fan engagement or comic book convention experience and why? You know, I've only done one. Isn't that crazy? I've no only done way. one convention, hello, in my life. And I would totally do more because I, I really love, um, the one I did was for Pacific Rim specifically. It was in Washington, D.C. And it was called um, Sh- uh, ShatterCon, I think, because it was the Shatterdome in um, Pacific Rim that was like the headquarters. And it was really great to meet fans face-to-face and just have that connection because especially right now it's so much online presence and social media. Um, But to actually 
meet and the people who come to the conventions really want to see you. So you don't have the trolls mixed in, <laughs> mixed in at the conventions. Right. You have the people who just really um, appreciate the work that, that you're doing and our work is for them. So it's just this reciprocal thing that I've only been able to do once <laughs> in my life, but I will do more. There will be more coming along the way. <laughs> That's good to hear. Yeah. Um, the sisterhood, the dark one uh, in Van Helsing, what can you tell us about Michaela and what did you enjoy most about playing her? Yeah, Michaela. So Michaela was kind of split into two parts for me because when she was around in season four, she had one arc and I loved how she came out of the tomb and she was, you know, centuries, years old. And uh, just had this kind of stoic nature about her, but also a bitterness because Bathory locked her in there. So there's this kind of rivalry that, that kind of is going on between the two of them that I got to play with Jesse Stanley. And we just, uh, it's so much fun kind of playing with that, um, that tension between us that kind of carried us through that season until I was decapitated. (laughs) And then, (laughs) uh, and then so fun. And then, you know, Jonathan Walker called me and asked if I was interested in coming back for season five and that we'd be shooting it in Bratislava, Slovakia. And I was just like, holy yes, yes, I'm absolutely in for this. So how often do you get to, you know, fly around the world and, and act in these gorgeous old historical castles and uh, just have those infuse your work? So of course it was a yes. So I went and that was, so then season five, the season five arc was a lot darker for Michaela. And I just, it was harder for me to get in it just because it was so dark. So what I had to do was kind of focus on her wants and her, I guess her desires. And that, that got me in. I was able to kind of really focus on those rather than, what she's doing because of what she was doing. I mean, she like slit of the throat of a young girl in one scene to get a bathtub full of fresh blood. You know, these moments where it's like, as an actor, you're like, hello, I'm, <laughs> you can't channel anything real from your life. Mm-hmm. So you just kind of- You would hope you not, kind of, yes. You would hope not. I, yeah, I truly, <laughs> truly hope that nobody <laughs> is channeling that. So yeah, I would just kind of focus on Michaela's wants and desires. And that's how I kind of got into her. Um, And then memorizing all the Latin and having that all ready to go for shoot days um, just used a different part of my brain. I think it used more of a mathy part of my brain, even though it's a language. It was uh, really just trying to to get those words to stick in there with the Latin. It was just so fun conjuring all that stuff in those castles. Michaela is great. And then, you know, she meets her uh, grisly demise once again. Bye, Michaela. Spoiler alert. <laughs> Spoiler. Oh, yes. Well, shoot. Right. I guess it's not on. Yeah. Well, it has well, it, aired it, on it, it has. It has. Yeah. It has aired um, uh, on Friday. Um, were you satisfied with the finale? Yes. Oh, I loved it. I mean, that image of, you know, Ivory just kind of walking um, into the distance was just so beautiful and such a, I don't know, it hit all these lovely notes of, um, isolation, but also hope all at once. I don't know. I really loved how they wrapped, wrapped it all up. Mm. I wonder how the fan, I'm curious about how the fans are feeling about how they wrapped it up, but I feel like the writers really did a great job working with COVID to create, uh, final season that really came together and was I thought it was very satisfying anyway but I did yeah. too yeah well I you know maybe that's maybe that's a reason for you to get on the comic book convention circuit yeah to get some immediate feedback from fans totally that would be super fun I don't like are the conventions coming back in person I guess it depends on they're starting this they're year starting back oh that's New York, exciting. New York Comic Con, I believe, is in person. We're lined up to do mm, maybe two or three this year um, before the end wow. of the year. That's Next great. year for sure. 
that is great. Yeah. Oh, I love, I love that it's coming back. Get to see people again. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's going back to being human, right? I know. What an human awkward interaction. Thing. Yeah, human interactions. What do we do again? What is this? <laughs> what do I have to say? Give me, a, give me a script. I don't know what to say. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Were you familiar with Zenoscope's comic, Van Helsing, for which the series is based? No, I wasn't. Um, I wasn't at all until my um, PR, my PR team um, kind of forwarded it along. So um, that, I think that's cool. Like when it, whenever you're doing a character to find different, um, different sources to, to pull your character from is important to me anyway. Like I would find um, even just the, the older Van Helsing film I watched to try to get into the whole tone of everything um, anything you can grab to aid in your character's development is important. So um, the Zenoscope comic would have been good in retrospect, but I only just found out about it now. Well, so. we'll, have to, we'll have to get you a goodie bag uh, <gasps> so that you can, so that you can even uh, a post-mortem, if you will, but at least, uh, at least if anybody asks you when you're on the comic book convention, you can say, yes, I do have mm-hmm. some. I do have some, and it's and it's right here with me. I've brought it along, actually. That's right. It is That's right. Yeah. Oh, that would be lovely. I would just love that. I really, really would, Mark. We'll, oh, we'll make it happen. I love chatting with you. Me too. Um, I've got a <laughs> few more, few more quick questions for you. Go um, for it. You've worked with a lot of incredible directors as well. Um, I don't want to miss them. So Guillermo del Toro, Tim Burton, the Duffer Brothers even. Who's been your favorite director to work with and why? Or you, you can name more than one if you like. More than one. Um, well, I mean, I, I would have to say that the most life-changing experience was the one with Guillermo for sure. Mm. He just um, was so welcoming in that there was kind of this misfit group of actors that he cast and we all came onto set that first day and he gave us a tour of the world that he'd created a tour of the kaiju and you know the monsters the aliens yeah. that come up from from the deep he had all of them in like um smaller models for us to see and he like introduced each of them and what their powers are who would be fighting them he showed us models of the Jaggers that we would be piloting and um, kind of gave us a synopsis. And he's just uh, very charismatic. So anything he says, you just want to follow along and <laughs> say yes to. I mean, if you've ever heard him even like speak about, he loves Hitchcock. And if you ever listen to any of his talks on just Hitchcock, those are just so enlightening. And also you just don't want to, uh, you know, tear your ears away from it. So yeah, that was also just being on set. It was just such a large scale blockbuster that I had never stepped onto, onto a set like that before. They, they'd created the heads of the Jaegers to scale. And so we were on a hydraulic system on a hydraulic platform and they created these heads, the heads of the Jaegers that we were piloting from inside the heads. And they were huge. Like, I don't even know what the magnitude of them was, but they were to scale just the head, not obviously not the body. They CGI would those, but the heads themselves we got into and we were on them and they were, um, you know, shaking it around and rocking it back and forth with the hydraulics exactly as if it was walking this huge robot. So just, uh, I think, yeah, the, just how big and grand the whole set was, was incredible. And Guillermo just was always unflappable he was very much on top of things on such a huge, you know, uh, production. huge production. Yeah. He just was always very calm. And I think at the time he was also finishing up Mama um, in, uh, in a different soundstage. Just at the beginning, the, the first week of filming, he was also finishing up filming another one he was doing, which was crazy. He was, I think he was doing like 18 hour days or something, but yeah, he, he, I went on there for a long time because he deserves it. It was a really incredible experience and really changed the way that I view. Um, I think um, 
relationships with crew members. He really treated everyone with respect and joked all day. Everything was really light and fun. And um, yeah, he really respected every single person on that set. Well, the last question I have for you is really just uh, kind of an open forum to you to uh, talk about what current projects you have in the works, anything you'd like to share. Yeah, the, the one that I am, had been working on until just recently was Charmed. And that was, um, that's been such a fun show to work on because, the, well, the particular character is the celestial being that comes from the stars to, you know, bring order to the world full of monsters and to cast the demons into the tomb of chaos and lock them up for good. And I just, uh, I just loved the metaphor that the writers were kind of creating with that character uh, who wanted right and wrong. She was very much about justice, um, innocent and guilty and, um, just lock them away if if there's anything out of line and there's so much going on right now in our you know current events with um authorities locking up and prison systems and everything that's going on so i think the writers really were trying to create a metaphor with the the characters but also do it in a really entertaining fun way that doesn't hit the nail on the head so I think it was really smart and it was a really fun set to work on with those girls and um, the character <laughs> was just super fun to play too so there you go Aladria and Charmed you can catch her she's 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 still there she's hanging on by a thread Very nice. well Heather thank you so much for joining us I've really enjoyed our conversation today and uh while we're all having Van Helsing withdrawals, uh, we're certainly happy we've got Charmed. Yeah, I know. It's so sad to say bye to a show when it ends. But that is the way. It teaches us about letting go, doesn't it? It does. <laughs> Onwards and upwards. Onwards and upwards. Mark, thanks so much for having me today. Of course. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>